So um, my name's Helen Blackie, and um, I've been involved in pest control and conservation for about 20 years, which makes me feel much older than I feel. Um, <laughs> and I, my background is really in the came from an I came from an academic field, and um, my background's in particularly R and D, so so new tools and technologies for pest control and management. Um, so that's kind of my passion. But I also do a lot of large scale landscape projects in terms of how we can restore biodiversity. Um, and most of my work's in New Zealand, but I work quite heavily with Australia and have done with the UK and other things as well. Um, and back in the day when I did my postgrad work, I spent about uh, five years, as my mother used to say, chasing possums. I'm not, I'm not sure she's actually realised that my job's changed in the last 20 years. But so my, that's what I did sort of back in the day. And yeah, so I've got a pretty good handle on the industry and where we're going and where we want to be going, I think. Which is why you're perfect for today's webinar, which is titled Emerging Technologies for Pest Control, and then in brackets, and something we've been wanting to talk about for quite some time, and what we can do about feral cats. Awesome. Thanks for that intro, Nick. Uh, so what I've actually done for this presentation, I've divided it into, into three parts. So the first part, I'm talking about some of the new tech we're working on, particularly in the AI space. Um, and then I've done a few slides, which is kind of tips and tricks. And, and this is because I always find when I give these types of talks that people like to pick up on tips and tricks that they can use themselves for their own pest control and, and some things that I've learned that might help other people. And then finally, um, I've got a section on feral cats and what we can do about feral cat control. And, um, I mean, you may choose to listen to all three or you may just choose to listen to, to the first one. It's up to you. Um, a disclaimer about feral cats. It's always difficult to talk about feral cats because um, yep. I get hate mail in a nutshell every time I do, <laughs> which is why I think it's quite hard in the industry for us to, to be straightforward and, and, and talk about what's going on. But I'm hoping that, you know, it's an area we need to talk about. So I'm going to give it a go today. And just before so, you do, just a, one quick thing with the chat box, everybody, write your questions in that chat box as we go through the presentation, and then it will be uh, those questions will be answered at the end in Q and A time. Thanks very much, Helen. All good. All good. Um, right. So the first the first section I wanted to talk about was some of the the new tech that that we're working on. Um, I haven't really talked about any of these ones before, so I'm hoping this is going to be of interest. And um, one of the reasons I like to focus on some of the new um, technological advances is is because it's it's good to see where we're going, and I think it gives us hope that a lot of the ambitions that we have, like a predator free 2050 future, um, you can kind of see how those might be made possible from some of these advances. So I'm focusing more today on, on how we're using AI specifically. So what I mean by artificial intelligence, and this is just the most general definition possible, it's basically, um, it's, it's the intelligence demonstrated by machines rather than us as humans. So basically, it's almost like a form of machine learning so that something else can make a decision rather than us sitting there in person making a decision ourselves. And the two ways at the moment that we're trying to bring AI into pest control, there's, there's two main areas that we're working on. Firstly, um, using AI to better control pests, and I'll talk about that first, and then using it to, to better detect pests. So um, one of the the most important things in terms of optimizing our control, particularly through traps, is actually looking to to redesign our traps in New Zealand. Um, most of our traps, and those of you who are familiar with dock tra traps will be able to relate to this, are, are, are designed actually more to keep non-target species out than to really get target species focused into going into traps. Um, Kia are a perfect example. They are really good at destroying things, they like to play with things, they're good at getting into traps. 
Um, so we, we've designed a sort of complex series of baffles and um, like in your dock boxes or um, a lot of other traps have small narrow tunnels or something. So um, for, for a long time, we've been really heavily constrained in terms of how we can design our traps based on, on, on how we can actually stop our non-target species getting into those, those, those devices. Um, and of course, what that means is we actually get a much lower capture success rate with those traps um, because deterring non-targets is great, but actually we're just making them too difficult for the target species to come in. And to get a high capture rate, we want to make it um, very simple for, for pests to interact with traps. Um, and actually also the other thing to note, these traps can be pretty difficult as well for, for, for users to, to set and use. And so even some of the new resetting traps that have that have come out, they've they've got great advantages, but those are actually also can have um, instances where non-target species have been able to trigger them. Um, I got sent these pictures, uh, I think it was last week, by Miranda Bennett from Auckland Council, and I and I thought this was a great example of of a frequent interaction, um, which can happen particularly with mustelids in in a trap. So um, I thought this was worth showing to explain what I mean. So there's the ferret going in, going, I know that's too hard, and off he goes. So um, that's kind of a good example of what we frequently see. Uh, sometimes we've got videos in front of traps. We also see uh, this going on with stoats in particular. They get close to the trap, they go in, and then they decide, oh, well, that's just a little bit too hard, or they get scratched by the baffles. And I always say to people, make sure you file your baffles back or put a little bit of um, tubing around it so it's nice and smooth. But this is a good example of a missed interaction, and um, uh, there's a fairly good chance sorry, Miranda, that, that that ferret won't go back and interact with another trap. So this is where um, we've been focusing our AI over the last few years. We've already got tools now that we've developed that enable us to instantly recognize species or the machine learning to, to instantly recognize species. So we've spent uh, four or five years collecting data on a variety of species through the mainland and offshore islands. It might be hard to see on your screen, but what I was trying to show in the little um, the little bits highlight uh, circled in red was was the, the species ID. Um, and of course, for a trap, you need an, an an instant identification of a species, not something that's going to happen five minutes later. So, it takes a long time to get these things working um, instantaneously. Um, so, we were funded by. Predator Free 2050 Limited last year, so a big shout out to them, um, to now look at integrating this AI into uh, a resetting trap. Um, so obviously the big advantage we've got there is we can then make these traps totally species specific. And we don't need these, these baffles or excluders and things to get rid of our non-targets anymore. So that means we don't have constraints in terms of the architecture of the traps we're using. Um, and the other huge advantage there is we, we don't need uh, that the pests don't need to do anything. So they don't need to pull on a bite bar. They don't need to stand on a metal plate, which has a you know weight limit on it. Um, so we're, we're expecting very little from animal behavior. Um, in addition to that, the other advantage we've got is if we're using AI, we can actually make sure that the animal is correctly placed in the trap to trigger the trap. So that means you, some of you may have seen instances, particularly in dock traps where uh, rats may be caught by a tail or, um, you know, an animal's been caught by a leg. So it, it actually makes the traps more humane as well and safe to use in other areas where you've got, you know, young children who, who can't be trusted, speaking of my own, um, <laughs> to not interfere with these things. And um, again, so, some, of the, some of the traps we've got are, are, are difficult to set. Um, you know, dock traps are, 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 are pretty tricky to manually manually set. So are a few of the other ones. So if there's nothing there for you to set, again, that's a, a big advantage. Um, and the pictures on the right just, just show some of the um, non-target species that are happy to stick their heads into boxes. So, um, you know, that's a kiwi pig, for example, show, uh, down the bottom. So it shows you that it, it is important that, that, that we factor all these species in, particularly as we're more successful if, with our pest control and our native biodiversity hopefully bounces back. 
So we've been uh, AI trap is um, is designed to to be totally set and forget. So you put it out and you leave it for um, the aim is for twelve months with with no servicing. It has its own um, law system built into it. So that's that's also been developed by Predator Free Twenty Fifty. That's the Easy Law system on the right is built into the trap. So. Um, that system can keep dispensing law, we know, from a minimum of 12 months. So you can program it. So in your trap, it dispenses a fresh bit of law once or twice a day, for example. Um, and I'm going to show you why that's so important for these types of devices. Uh, we know that the, the trap's capable of over 100 kills, but to be honest, I don't think, I don't think anyone is ever going to kill that many individuals with one trap. So it, basically, it's it's resettable for as many times as you're ever going to need it. Um, that's just our proto trap, prototype trap on the left, but it's um, substantially smaller than, say, a dock box, and it's pretty easy um, to carry around, and it can be made modular. Um, and we've got two designs at the moment, one which is um, – mustelid and rat sized. The bonus of that trap is unlike something like a dock trap, which usually doesn't trigger on mice, it, it can also trigger on mice. And a lot of people are quite keen to control mice as well, particularly uh, as if you're really successful with your pest control, but you don't target mice, mice numbers can um, go up. And then we have another, another trap, which is more focused towards the larger species like possums. And I think uh, Nick, this next slide might be the first video. So I'm just going to flick over to Nick. Oh, perfect. Um, so what this is just showing is a, a rat interacting with um, one of our prototype traps. So he's actually eating the um, the lure, which is designed, because it's a fresh food, to be in there like a pre-feed. And he's sticking his head up now into the trapping area. So this was us. Um, these are from trials where we've been collecting the AI data that we need for um, to make sure the animal's in the right place and um, and interacting with the trap correctly before um, before it triggers the trap mechanism, which is the next step. And Nick, if you go to the next video, I'll um, I'll show that. Yeah, um, this is a good example. This is this is eight days after the first video, so. Obviously, this trap is still pre-feeding, and um, I'm going to come back to this later in my talk, but this is what happens if you pre-feed over a week, in this case, with one trap. So um, the, uh, the, the best law for rats is the social communication that rats have between themselves to um, basically talk to each other and tell each other that there's a food source nearby. So... Um, uh, I highly recommend pre-feeding basically any traps you use to get these species coming in. Um, and the huge advantage about having these traps is we can also use them to pre-feed. Um, so you can, for instance, leave it running for two weeks without activating the trap mechanism, get your, your animal used to coming to the trap, and, and then you can remotely flip it over into, into kill mode. Um, and it's great for uh, increasing your, your interaction rates. So what we're doing with these traps now is we're just about to start undertaking our first set of um, kill trials. And then we're running a set of non-target trials just to um, make sure we've got all the AI sorted on those non-target species. Again, we've got quite a few years worth of data, so um, we're well ahead of the game. And then we uh, will be undertaking field trials of the, the traps and they should be available um, late next year, commercially available late next year or, or the year after. Um, and also the same technology can be used on live capture traps. Um, it's basically exactly the same. It, it, it works the same way. And instead of triggering a kill trap, it will trigger a, a, um, a live capture trap. And um, I've just got an example here of the of the difference in size between traps because um, people always ask. And our traps that Credit Solutions AI trap there. So you can see in terms of architecture, it doesn't it doesn't have um, baffles or little uh, uh, entrance ways or tunnels or um, it doesn't need wire around it to keep out those those non targets. So it's um, seems to have great interaction rates so far. Um, 
the second uh, project we're working on for AI at the moment is in terms of surveillance. Um, I've been involved in AI for pest surveillance for a good decade or so now, but um, one one tool that a lot of us have used in the sector and a lot of you may use as well is is cameras for detecting pests. Um, the, tra the trouble with cameras, and there's quite a few of them, is they can be high cost, particularly for the good ones. And if you can, a good one's much better than a cheap one. Um, we have huge problems with false triggers. Anyone in my team at work will constantly groan when we run our big camera trials because and we'll get tens of thousands of false images, um, sometimes on a single camera, of blowing grass or a bit of fern frond or something, um, which of course fills up the camera really fast, fills up the SD card and burns through the battery. Um, and someone has to manually sort and interpret those images as well, which is really, really time consuming. And again, most people in my team in the middle of grown every time we get to do it because it's a huge amount of work. Um, what we also know is that they miss many of the of the small mammals, um, particularly mice. I'd, I, um, my estimates have been about 50% of mice will be missed, my, missed by them. But um, it can also be uh, some of those smaller mustelids and, and rodents as well. Uh, and the big other concern is that um, there is actually quite a bit of aversion behaviour to camera traps. Um, they've got a huge problem now with feral cats in Australia showing significant aversion behaviour to, to camera traps, for example. And um, that picture on the right's not just there because the stone looks cute, but that's just an example of, of a lot a lot of the images we get of, of stoats in particular um, in our trials, and that was collected during a law trial, is the stoat just sitting looking at the camera. Um, and then they'll just bounce out of the screen again. Um, so they do make a lot of noise. They make a lot of ticks, whirs, clicks and, and things. And, and some of our species, particularly the stoats, are quite sensitive to that. Um, there are some of the newer technologies like thermal cameras coming out, but um, those technologies are super expensive. At the moment, they've got a really short battery life and limited operation time. So because they rely on um, a, th a thermal background to be able to differentiate between a rock and a stoat, you, um, they doesn't mean that they're operational 24-7, um, which can be really problematic if you're looking to pick up um, species that uh, in an incursion scenario, for example. So we're developing a really low cost camera device at the moment um, that's also really low power, so will last for a really long time in the field. Um, and the main difference is it also integrates all the AI classifications we've been doing over the last few years. So you'll get um, real-time notifications of, of your pest to the species level, um, and that will all be displayed on a visual, visual dashboard. Um, so basically, you can look at all your results online or just the species you're interested in. Um, and again, this is integrated with our easy lure system as well, which is our lure delivery system. The, um, just to put that in a big picture, because I'm only talking about some of our tech stuff today, um, the, the, we've really carefully over the last few years worked on an integrated solution to, to these tools. So we've got one project which is based on the comm system we know we need for these cameras and these traps. That's the FlexiComs project. We've um, successfully developed our long life law dispenser, the easy law system that can be used either on its own or um, that's about to go commercially available. And it's we've got great results using that. It's able to be retrofitted to all current traps, trapinators, stock traps, podi traps, etc. Um, and again, that links in with some AI monitoring we've developed through our Critipic platform. And all of those things together then link into things like a, a um, AI trap system. So um, we've always had this holistic picture in mind that we need to work through all these all these issues, not just not just um, one or two. And if you want any information on some of those other things, you can go to our Credit Solutions website. Um, that's the website down the bottom there, the web address, and, and it has some of our um, current products up there as well. That's our little Critipix system designed for 
uh, lizards and inverts and small species. So you can have a look through there if you're keen. And uh, now I'll move on to the second, the second part of my talk, which is my tips and tricks section. Um, and again, this is mainly because this is the kind of things that people always find interesting in the questions section. So I thought I'd pr try and preempt some things this year. Fantastic. <laughs> So, um, firstly, I, I, I think <clears throat> I am a fan of cameras, and I think if you've got a pest control project, they, they can provide you a lot of useful information about the pests in your area, what they're, what they're feeding on, where they're coming from, um, their movement patterns, what's present and absent, absent. But we do know some species can be camera shy, as, as, as we call it. Um, and and I always say, if you can, try and avoid focusing your cameras directly on traps for this reason. Um, I have a lot of people who say, oh, I had this really good trapping regime and then I put out all these cameras and now nothing's coming to the traps anymore. And it's not because the trapping regime's failing. It may be because you've created a giant flashing, glowing light up area every time the animal walks in front of that trap. So just use them. I, I highly recommend you use them, but make sure you're careful about the purpose that you use them for. Um, I'm a big fan of pre-feeding as well, and um, that's a picture on the the, the right-hand side is is um, rats queuing up to get to my pre-feed in the in the uh, trapping unit. Um, but whether you're using them in your traps for for like you might leave your dock traps unset for a while and have a a food source in there that you refresh frequently that those animals can get used to feeding on. Um, or you can attach our easy law system uh, for that reason because it will keep dispensing fresh law. It's great for, for increasing your interaction rates and overcoming the, the neophobia that some species may have, that sort of fear of new things in their environment. Um, and again, if, if anyone's doing toxic, toxin control, I, 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 I fully recommend you do pre-feeding as much as possible then. Um, this is something that I'm, I'm that concerns me about a lot of people's projects. Please don't walk your dogs down your pest um, trap lines or your monitoring lines if if, if you can help it, um, because they are actually a predator of many of the species that we're targeting. So they can they can deter your your uh, target species from getting into traps or devices if there's this really heavy scent of, of dogs being present in an area. Obviously, if they're conservation dogs being used for a different purpose, that's different. But but try and try and stop your dogs from having a sniff around the traps and um, you know going to the bathroom near the traps or, or monitoring devices because um, it can it can deter your 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 pests, particularly the mustelids, from going near those traps in the future. Um, the other thing I always say is is try and microsite your traps. So so um, when you put them out, think really carefully about where you're putting them. Um, for mustelids in particular, the three R's, the roads, ridges, and rivers, um, are the good things to target because that's where they like to move, um, and they've got quite quite pronounced preferences and where they move in the environment. Um, habitat boundaries are also really good places to trap and usually have have good capture rates. Um, and and if, you, if you're not getting success in your trap, and j just move it a few metres, and that's sometimes all it needs to, to uh, ensure success. Uh, if you're using dock boxes, always make sure that they're um, totally flat and unable to be wobbled or moved, because if you can wobble them, an animal won't like going into them either. They need to be, they need to be really secure on the ground. And also make sure you, you test and audit them frequently. Um, Particularly the the again the dock traps because they can uh, you want to, you you want to ensure that they are working and that they're in a a really good standard both for humaneness reasons and and to make sure that you're not just getting a whole lot of missed missed interactions. Uh, also, make sure you mix up your lures. Um, sometimes I talk to groups and they say, "Oh, we've been using lure X for two years and we've had some really good success." And I always think, "Oh gosh, no." Um, I, I don't mean I don't mean mix up your lures and put in a whole lot at once because I don't think that's a great strategy either. But we do know that uh, there's a lot of individual preference between uh, just like us, you know, 
Tim might like pizza and I might like salads. <laughs> oh, Nick, Nick, sorry, it's an example. So, you know, it's, it's yeah, just, just keep changing things out and have a bit of a variety. Um, and the same thing with trap type. Um, obviously, always consider your non-target risk, but, but it is good to have a mixture of trap types. You may find that, you know, trap A, catches a certain percent of the population as soon as you put a different trap type in you might catch some individuals that weren't willing to go into the the first one so that's it for my tips and tricks um the third part of this talk was was about the feral cats um and i i've i felt recently that i could relate to this statement that came out um from jan wright a few years ago saying that um you know she'd become increasingly concerned about the the numbers of feral cats that were now present in New Zealand and and over the last 12 months in particular this is this is uh, there's been certainly growing concern amongst a lot of us that that we're starting to face a really substantial problem um I'll right from the start I'll just outline what I mean by feral cats because I'm not talking about stray cats I'm basically talking about cats that have no um, a form of interaction with, with humans at all. They're unowned and unsocialized. Um, they don't have any reliance on humans for food or, or shelter or anything else. So they're living in, um, they're, they're, they're self-sufficient and they're living in populations where they're, they're happily reproducing on their own accord. Um, of course, they're almost impossible to tell apart from stray cats because they are, they are the same colors in most, in most instances. Um, so strays are the, are the sort of cats that have, that have at, at least at some stage in their life relied on, on humans for survival. Um, and those, those are more like the cats you see that might be uh, near a landfill or um, may have been dumped. Um, and unfortunately, they're usually reproducing without human manipulation as well, but their behavior is a little bit different than those cats we would consider feral. So the, the history of cats in New Zealand is actually quite interesting because we've had feral cats uh, established in the North Island since 1830s. So they've had a long time to get themselves established now um, in the 1840s and in, in, in the South Island. Um, and of course, being the, <laughs> we, they, were, they were the great strategy back in the day. A lot of farmers released them to try and stop our exploding rabbit population, just like the ferrets and stoats. Um, so none of those strategies ended up being being good. And unfortunately, the other thing that happened was that they were introduced to an awful lot of offshore islands as well, over 30 offshore islands. Um, so they had some pretty detrimental effects, not just in the mainland. Um, so the, the latest estimates I've seen is that we've got over two and a half million feral cats in New Zealand. I suspect it's much more than that, much more than that from what we've been seeing recently. Um, and they are rampant on some of those main um, offshore islands as well. We have had success at eradicate, eradicating them from some islands, um, but they're also really well adapted to many environments. Um, you know, obviously they're happy to live in semi-urban environments, but they also arrive through farmland right right up to the um, subalpine zone as well. Um, and of course, they're really skilled hunters. They've got a really varied diet. We've got they they have nothing that predates on them in New Zealand, so there's very little constraints to their population growth. And as all you guys will be aware, I'm sure we our fauna evolved without mammalian predators. So cats are extremely um, adept predator, and it's um, it's not doing any favors to uh, um, our fauna. And we've already got some catastrophic examples of their of their impacts. Um, We've had some species that have already become extinct due to cats. Um, the little wren at the top there that that um, became extinct in 1985. We've got the the impact on on kakapo at one stage was was horrendous. Um, <laughs> we almost lost the population due to a lighthouse keeper's cat. Um, and that picture down the bottom there shows the impact of one cat. Um, which preyed on 107 short-tailed bats in seven days. Um, so, you know, they, they have a catastrophic impact on, on our wildlife. Um, this is just um, drives part of what I wanted to say, which was that 
We've done a huge amount of work around the country for our projects in the last few years, particularly looking at, at, at lures and, um, you know, new attractants for various pest species. And, and we now get more feral cats in our cameras than we get possums. Um, so while we've become really accustomed to dealing with um, possums in New Zealand and recognising that as a, as a, as a problem, um, the, the feral cats are becoming extremely widespread. And, and when we run these trials, our data is just absolutely, um, yeah, covered with feral cat pictures. And uh, we've actually had feral cats sit in front of traps and prevent other species from get, coming into them, including in front of dock traps. Um, and some of the pre-feed experiments we've done, same thing. They just come back day after day and basically scare off any other target species as well. Um, and some of these are huge cats. You look at that one on the bottom right hand that's climbing up a, up a tree. That they're, they're, yeah, they're pretty terrifying predators. <laughs> so we, we really need to start thinking about more widespread feral cat, feral cat control if we're looking at um, predator control in New Zealand. Um, we know they're having a, a catastrophic, catastrophic impact on, on some of our current native wildlife. Um, particularly the things like the dotterel and terns. Um, and they're already right through basically all our ecological niches in, in, in New Zealand. And their, their populations are clearly increasing rapidly. Um, the other thing is they're more sort of similar to stoats in terms of they're, they're, they're quite cautious about things in their environment, which means they can be, they can be difficult to trap. Um, if you are going to um, trap cats, it's and these traps shouldn't be used in, in urban areas for obvious reasons, but make sure you use a cat trap which is NAWAC approved. So that means it's, it's been approved and gone through the humaneness and animal welfare testing. Um, I think the only two approved so far that I've seen are the, the, the TIMS trap and the SA2 cat trap. Um, and that just shows you some examples of how you should set these these traps to keep them out of the way of some of the um, domestic pets and things that might be in your environment. But make sure you always think about that um, before you start using any form of lethal cat control. Um, and a few tips for that. If you are in an urban area or, or, or a farm area, you're best to use live capture traps. Um, and then you can you can judge whether the cat is feral or not. I've never had an instance where I haven't been able to tell whether the cat is, is feral. If you're dealing with a true feral cat in a live capture cage, you can you can tell. Um, in terms of bait, they like a variety of bait: um, fish, rabbit, um, uh, smelly baits. They like. Um, you can use cat food biscuits, although they usually don't have such a scent to pull them in from such a distance away. Um, minced meat. We know that both our Poa Uku laws and Easy laws are highly attractive to cats because we've got so many interactions uh, during those trials through New Zealand. Um, an ascent trail up to the uh, up up to the traps always a really good idea if you can. And again, as per my tips and tricks se section, um, change the baits um, if you can at a, a frequent interval, and you'll get you'll get you'll suddenly get a cat come out of the woodwork. Uh, and and the best time to to um, control feral cats is, is during the winter months. So um, this time of year is good because there's less food sources available. Um, and if you are using live capture traps, obviously the, the regulation is you have to check it um, as soon as you can the following morning. Following morning. Um, if you're looking to do a widespread control operation with traps, you really want to put these traps every um, 100 to 200 metres along uh, linear features of your of your landscape. And what about in more remote areas? Because um, the, the problem with cat control is that a lot of those trapping methods are really labour intensive and they still result in quite low population reductions. So there's a lot of continued perseverance that's needed to try and make a dent in those cat populations. So if you're able to in remote areas, I, I recommend the use of PAP. Um, we call it PAP because saying paraminoprophenone is, is a real mouthful, but that's what it stands for. Um, if you're using PAP, it does require a controlled substance license. Um, so you either need to use a contractor who's got a, a CSL license, or if you've got a CSL license, you can go and add the PAP on as part of your, your license. 
Um, the benefits of PAP is that it's firstly it's got an antidote, so that's that's really important. If you use it on a site, there's a readily available antidote, methylene blue, which is great. Um, in terms of a toxin, it's it's very r rapid and it's it's um, a very humane action. So it's basically, if you talk about it in the easier sense, it's just like it, it, an, an animal's going to sleep. So it's much better than a lot of the other toxins we use in terms of humaneness. Um, and it's quite species specific. So it's quite specific to mammalian carnivores, which means that it doesn't have the risk to a non-target species like birds. Um, but it is a risk to dogs. So if you're going to use PAP, the um, dogs are a risk. So make sure that they're either safely put away while you've got your toxin out or um, you use a sensible bait station that they can't access. And this is the type of bait station we recommend. This can be used either for a bait station or to put a trap in, by the way. Um, and if you if you go online or look in the, there's a best practice manual for um, feral cats with PAP. And I think it has the dimensions of these cat boxes in, so you can make them make them yourselves, but it's designed to keep out non-target species. Um, and this is an example of, a, of an operation we did for a, a large area which um, had a, a significant Kiwi and, and Fio population. Um, so they had a huge feral cat problem. When I got to the site, I actually witnessed a, a feral cat killing a New Zealand falcon, which was pretty upsetting. So um, they had had no impact on the population through uh, shooting or trapping. So they decided to try a different regime. So these guys spread out these these chimney bait stations about every 500 metres, um, which is based on what we know about cat home ranges. And then um, the recommendation is you pre-feed them with meatballs, basically, first to get them used to eating um, eating the, the pre-feed. So what we noticed was at, at this trial site, we... Um, we pre-fed twice in some parts of the site and three times in other sites. And uh, we did the, we pre-fed every seven days before switching to toxin bait. And the cats had clicked in and would come to the stations almost 15 minutes after we put the pre-feed out after a while to go in there. And you can see how easily they can jump in and out of those, of those stations. Um, and then you just put in these two little toxin balls. They're coloured green, but that is mints still. They have to be coloured green because they contain toxin. So those those go in seven days after after you've done your pre-feeding. Um, we put two in each station. Um, and then another seven days later, seven days because the meat can start to go off, um, you either refresh them again um, or you remove them. So obviously remove the ones that, that haven't been eaten at the at the end of your trial. Um, and this trial we did here, we, we used camera monitoring to determine how many feral cats we actually removed. And we had about an 80% knockdown. Um, so that was, that was, and it basically it cost 40 cents a bait. And I think we figured out $30 a chimney station. So it was a pretty cost effective operation for, for a really good outcome. Um, and the good thing about these these chimney stations, they can be a bit of work to put out, but but you can then use them afterwards to to put things like a Tim's trap inside. And once they're on site, they're there. You can leave them out there permanently. And if your cat numbers creep back up, you can use um, you can put another pulse of pap down. Um, and we did f find that the more we prefed for, that the better the result was. So. Um, is 20 days was 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 better than than one week for example so if you can pre-feed say three times get the cats used to coming in and switch over to your toxin you get a really good a really good knockdown so so that's it that's um <coughs> covered off the main things that i wanted to talk about today so hopefully that's left some time for questions if anyone's got any You've done fantastically well. Well done. And also to, um, while well, you have a glass, uh, you know, drink of water, as you deserve. <laughs> um, also, thanks, everybody. Um, the questions have been great. We've got a huge audience, so we're not going to get through all the questions. But also, can I just say about, while you were talking about the cats, it was fantastic to see other people who obviously have great experience in the same area um, just give um, their thoughts and advice um, down and, wait, and, and some some sort of tips, um, really cool. And it is great to be able to openly talk 
about feral cats in a conversation. Um, it is a motive, I know, but seeing the uh, the response, it's a great start. Well done. Good job. Um, <laughs> we, we will get back, I'm sure, to cattle two question, um, but I'm just going to go from a few. This is rapid fire. So um, cost was mentioned a bit with the AI traps. Um, that seemed to be a question that came through a bit. They're trying to work out the cost. We're trying to, um, in, in a nutshell, it's hard to predict the cost at the moment, mainly because uh, the cost 18 months ago is really different to the cost now. We've got huge shortages in microchips and electronic components and huge delays in delivery times. But we're, they'll be on par with other resetting traps. So they're not going to be more expensive than most of the other resetting traps that are currently on the market, although they will have the AI capabilities. Can changing a trap from pre-feed to actually trapping be done from a remote location? Yes, yeah, so that, that is built into our AI traps. Yep, yep. So you could, you could. That that was the that's that, that's our plan. So you'll be able to pre-feed for a few weeks, get the species used to coming in. Um, the the pre-feeding that I did for two weeks to test that we we, we had everything. We had ferrets, rats, mice. Um, possums, feral cats, and everything, and 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 so it, it's it's really advantageous to do that. And the aim is if you could do that remotely rather than having to go and and um, push another button or turn a switch or whatever, that's a huge advantage as well. Taylor asks, how would the um, AI tech components handle sand and coastal environments? Um, it it it's. It's too smart for that, so it would be it would be fine in that environment because it's able to uh, recalibrate itself basically. And we have tested, we have we've got as I mentioned before, four or five years of imagery data already collected for the AI. So it's been uh, it's been frozen, it's been <laughs> it's been swamped swamped by water and in floods, and it's had things build nests inside it and things like that. So yeah, that that. That um, the data that's needed to be collected to make accurate AI is pretty intense for those reasons. But, but yeah, I think we've broken the back on that. Have you, or do you intend to do any work on contraceptive control for rodents? I'm not in that contraceptive space anymore. Um, I know that there is other groups working in that space. If my opinion on that is that it is not a silver bullet in New Zealand for conservation because there's some major um, there's some major issues there that we need to overcome about um, how every animal basically is subject to that method of contraceptive, whether it's a virus, for example, or fed in a bait. But but the other the other thing there is if we use possums as an example of that, a possum can live 14 years. So even if you make it infertile, it can still inflict a huge amount of damage in that period of time. And a lot of our native species don't have time on their side. So that's the reason a lot of people are more um, focused on what we can do now to eradicate species than, than yeah, something that might take a long time. Nigel asks, are um, uh, the cameras also good for picking up feral goats? Yeah, wallabies, goats, um, people. I shouldn't joke about that, but actually we've, we put them out on a lot of land, private land, and got a, got a lot of people who weren't supposed to be there, including stealing the cameras. Um, so, yeah, they, 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 yeah they, they can be modified to anything. We're modifying them at the moment for um, a whole lot of feral species, species in Australia, which are obviously not the same that we've got here uh and, and actually they're being modified for individual id in australia so um they can tell the difference between individuals as well nigel last technical question are the cameras no glow 940 nm infrared cameras or low glow 850 nm uh, that the animals are detecting yeah the animals can't detect them so that we've we've done a lot of work on different wavelengths to figure out um and it actually uses a combination to to, to make to get to the crux of that but but um both the ai trap and the and the camera because we wanted to avoid that neophobia issue we've done that by removing the wavelengths that the animals can see in uh chrissy asks does the ai traps require cell coverage no, no. So it links in with our um, FlexiComs technology.
technology, which you can read up more on on uh, Critter Solutions website. So um, that technology either uses um, Wi-Fi, the cell network, or satellite coverage. So hence the name FlexiComs. So depending on what what area you're in and what coverage you've got, you've got an option for for um, any environment. Uh, Willem asks, is fish bait area dependent? I've tried salmon spray and fish lures, but no success at all. I work in the Hanua Ranges. Oh, he's right by me. I'm, I'm out by the Hanua Ranges. Um, and it, it depends what your target species is. So and, and a, that's it's it's an interesting question. I know more about stoat behaviour to lures than, than, than cat behaviour. What I've noticed with stoats is they're – Food preferences are slightly different in coastal areas, for example, than they are in, in mountain areas, which makes a lot of sense. But um, if you're not having success with one bait, just switch it to, to something different. Um, because, again, there's they, they, a lot of them are clued in to, to what they're um, eating in their environment. So who knew arranges? There's a lot of rabbits out here. So rabbit would probably be a good, a good option for cats. Dan, Dan asks, Helen, can – I think it's – Pauku lures be refreshed yeah. after their six month lifespan. If so, yeah, what? they can they can be retreated, so they can come back and be and be retreated again. Yeah. Do you find the possums are attracted to the cameras? Yes, they like they like to chew them, eat them, destroy them. Um, sometimes I think. Uh, not uh, so they're attracted to traditional cameras. We haven't had the same problem with our. Um, new cameras. I think a lot of it's to do with the flashes, the noises, the you know the little whizzes they make. Um, but also, possums are quite inquisitive, and they're not phobic like some of the other species. So they'll actually just they'll actually investigate things in the environment, and sometimes they will destroy them as well. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> they jump on top of them. Make make sure they make sure your cameras are well fastened. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, Avon writes, and quite a few people have also asked, you mentioned that, that you can genuinely tell between a uh, domestic cat and a feral cat in a cat trap. Um, can you give us your, the what you have noticed? If uh, the feral cats that I have live capture trapped, uh, um, uh, if when you go near the tra trap, they absolutely lose the plot. They, they, they're incredibly distressed and upset. They're incredibly... Um, disturbed by by being captured in a trap. If if you're more likely to get a stray cat, they don't have that same reaction to, to human presence. They've they've probably at some stage been even if it was years ago been domesticated or had some form of interactions with humans. So um, that's probably not an absolute rule, but it, it also probably depends on on where you are in in the in the environment. And um, one thing with things like AI traps, of course, you can also build in um, the ability to, to not trigger if a cat is microchipped, for example. Um, so, you know, we've got the ability to build in other smart sensors like that too. But yeah, most of the feral cats I've dealt with are not something. They don't, they don't act like, you know, fluffy from next door, put it that way. <laughs> Absolutely, yep. Ben asks, who will undertake euthanasia? Um have tried SPCA, but no answer. Tried Animal Welfare Auckland Council, but they no longer deal with cats. Any thoughts? I was going to say contact your council, but that makes me not very hopeful in that instance. Um, and yes, the S SPCA sometimes isn't very um, helpful. Um, you ca you can contact local vets and, and ask if they will assist. Um but otherwise, it's probably specific to the region you're in as to the best person to, to contact. Some councils are, 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 are much more helpful than others. But um, again, that's just, one of the reasons we need to have this conversation so that people yeah. know what to do. Yeah, yeah. I just said some vets will do it. Yeah, so I have heard of some vets who will do it. So um, people have said to me, gosh, what do I do? And, and if the council or the SPCA won't assist, uh, you can approach um, vets and local vets will 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 sometimes assist for, for, without a charge. Um, Nigel asks, "What's the typical uh, feeding range of a feral cat, and why do you need to have traps every uh, one hundred to two hundred meters?" 
Uh, so, so feral cats can have a really, really long range. And also at other times of the year, female cats can have a really small range. So most of the time, the distance between traps is, is based around this, the, an animal's smallest home range. Um, but also that's designed to be um, an intensive regime. When we did PAP, we did one every 500 metres, for example. But with traps, you're probably more likely to get cats walking past one trap. And those, 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 that spacing is just designed for ridge lines and uh, roadways and sort of um, linear features in the landscape. So it's not, it's not 100 to 200 metres on a grid. If you were doing a grid, I'd, I'd be more focused on the um, 500 metre um, setup in a grid pattern. Um, it's interesting that just in the chat line, just a, a, a little uh, run we're having, Maddie, who's a vet, says, I will do it, but who pays for it? And then somebody comes in and says, our council is amazing. They take care of it. And then somebody else um, yeah. comes in and says, I know vets who will do it for free. So Yeah, it's really varied. Yeah. But isn't it great that the people are willing to talk and help and, and create the sort of common goal, which is good? It would be good if we had a consistent uh, nationwide approach to dealing with it, though, because it, it does seem, my experience is it's very variable depending on what part of the country you're in. And and um, there are other, some parts of the country where, where feral cats are an issue to livestock as well, particularly lambs. So um, those councils are usually a bit more proactive than maybe some of the urban-based councils. Mark asks, could thermal cameras be fitted with solar panels to extend their daily oh, yeah. operation? Yep, yep, that's doable now. So, yep, I think we've got a prototype for that. So, it's both both the, both the traps and the cameras. Yep. Um, although our cameras are designed to be incredibly uh, long life already, um, yes. In a nutshell, yes, we can we can attach thermal thermal stuff to them. Yep. Another tech question: um, uh, Is is an accuracy white paper available? Is processing local or cloud? Uh, the processing, is, depending on which technology we're talking about, is is on board now. So it is no longer in the cloud. It's it's the the so in a nutshell, that means that the device can think for itself, um, rather than had to have to go through uh, like a cloud based platform to make the decision. Um, so on board processing, but that de that depends exactly which technology you're you're talking about. Um, we've rapidly fired through everything uh, at the moment and there'll be more coming through but it's a great time i think uh, it's been huge audience absolutely huge audience and great questions and great participation and everyone's been so nicely behaved it's been just great um i suppose final thing from you i mean so you're pretty well obviously pretty excited with how all the ai stuff's going are we really starting to ramp this up is the speed is it speeding up now yeah, I think that the biggest change from a researcher perspective in the last in the last period of time has been the availability of funds to help these tools. Um, uh, Predator Free Twenty Fifty Limited for, for us has been really game changing because it's taken a lot of these tools from concept to actually be able to push them right through to commercialization, and they've been really super supportive to work with. So. Um, having been in the industry in 20, for 20 years, they've been by far the biggest difference in terms of actually helping from a research perspective and also being really understanding when we had all these, when we had an atrocious time being Auckland-based in COVID with lockdowns um, and, and you know, changes in, in costs and, and timetables and things. So they, they, they do deserve a big shout out for really helping move things in this space rapidly and, and, and it gives – you know, there's a lot of other people working on other great tools, and it gives me a lot of hope that that this this stuff will become a reality rather than a, a pipe dream. And the advances we've made in the last five years, even, have been have been fantastic. And and most of us just needed the funding to help us get there. So yeah, it's been it's been it's been great. It's a good, it's there's going to be some really exciting new tools for everybody in the in, in the next sort of twelve to thirty six months. You've been fantastic. It's just um, it. It's been a great webinar. Just final from you. And I I often ask people this. You're in the space every day. What do you say to people who are out there to motivate them to keep going in small groups doing so much good work? What do you say to them so that they take a message home? 
Oh, I often I often say this, and I, I think this all the time, is that, that those people are the most important people to this whole process. So I mean, we can develop all these tools and technologies and get really enthusiastic, but the people on the ground doing the work um, – are the ones who deserve the most credit, and 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 the, the biggest change for me in the last ten years has, and 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 the great thing about the Predator Free Initiative has is to see all these people get behind it, and 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 to get enthused and say, oh, I'm becoming more aware of these issues. I'm going to start trapping in my back garden or my local bit of bush, or, um, and you know, I, I see very young children, and and my 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 child could trap it a rat from about the age of three but <laughs> but right through to, to you know i work i work with people who are much later on in life a lot of retirees and they're it's, it's awesome their their motivation is is fantastic and their enthusiasm and and i think that's the most humbling thing of of this this sort of initiative and it makes me think we, we, we've got a big chance of success if we keep the people with us Dr. Helen Blackie, you're a tremendous. Thank you so much for your time and your information and your uh, resources. Um, and on behalf of Predator Free New Zealand Trust, we thank you for joining us. That's been an immensely large webinar and we loved having you. So uh, keep up the good work and we will catch you for our next one. All good. Thanks, thanks Nick. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. Bye. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you at our next webinar and keep up the great work. Bye-bye.